Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to worship this evening. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Opening hymn for this evening is found on the inside cover of our worship bulletin. Things. 
We read in Jeremiah 23, beginning at the 23rd verse. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? I have heard what the prophets who prophesy lies in my name are saying. They say, I had a dream, I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? They think the dreams they tell one another will make my people forget my name, just as their fathers forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream tell his dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Here ends our Old Testament lesson. Our psalm for the day is taken from portions of uh, Psalm 98. We begin by singing the refrain.
We now continue with our uh, sermon hymn for this evening. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? And if you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline or training, then you are illegitimate children, and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us or trained us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. <laughs> Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. These are the words of our Lord. In the name of our Savior, dear Christian friends, although it may not be completely noticeable from the first initial reading through this text, this entire text is talking about a Christian running their race. And it's a race that, as the writer to the Hebrews reminds us, it's a race that God has marked out for us. In other words, each one of us has a different race to run. They're all different. How my race, my Christian race, will, when it will end and how it will end, may be completely different from each of your races that God has marked out for each of us. And how uh, we are to run this race, the Apostle describes in this letter to the Hebrews tonight. 
And he reminds us how we are to patiently and with perseverance run the race which God set before us. The first thing he reminds us is he says, get rid of what you don't need or whatever uh, can slow us down. He described it this way. He says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. The first thing the Lord wants us to do is to run our race efficiently. And in other words, what should we run with and what should we not run with? And uh, when the runners were running for in the Olympics, did they have a lot of clothes on? Were they all bundled up? Did they run with their cell phones in their shorts pockets? Did any of them have a bottle of water while they were running? Now, you know, you may think that, and really when you think about it, this is not a sprint that the writer is, or the apostle is describing to us as our race. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And yet, even marathon runners, they don't run uh, the whole race with bottled water. I mean, it's picked up quickly, used, and thrown. And then they keep moving. So applying that to our Christian life, uh, what is there in our lives that may uh, be hindering us, slowing us down, becoming too much of baggage or weight or a burden, and it doesn't help us run our Christian race well? And nobody's going to be able to tell us these things. This is where each Christian is going to have to examine and analyze our own lives and then maybe determine that uh, this thing or this whatever in my life is not helping me run my race. The other thing that he reminds us is that we are to get rid of is the sin that so easily entangles. Imagine trying to run a race with your shoelaces untied. That could be downright dangerous, right? So that's the exact idea that the apostle says about sin being in our lives, that it entangles us, it trips us up. And that's how scripture often uh, describes falling into temptation, falling into sin. And that's almost the exact same uh, idea here. And as we run our race, he now goes on and reminds us, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. When uh, anybody runs a race, where are they supposed to be looking? Right? Where, where are you supposed to be looking? And when they train anybody for running, they tell them, don't look back, won't look behind. Don't try to see where the runners are next to you or behind you because you're going to lose your step, you may uh, lose time, and ultimately it may cost you the race if not even causing you to trip yourself up because you are turning around. And even the Bible says this. Uh, in the letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, it says, don't look back. Keep focusing ahead. And notice he says, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter, or the beginner and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endure, endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus, who is the beginner and finisher of our faith, we saw the beginning already in Bethlehem, and he continued to run that race all the way till he completed it. And there was a major milestone or hurdle that he uh, got over when that path led him to Calvary's cross. And there, before he breathed his last, what did he say? It is finished. It is finished. So he has finished taking care of all of the work God gave him to do. Nothing was left undone. And He's the finisher of our faith. In other words, the race is already run, won. When we are running our race, it's not to earn, it's not to gain for ourselves heaven, but it is to complete with perseverance the race that God has marked out for each of us. 
as he has asked us to do. So we serve our Lord in, in faithfulness and thankfulness for this free gift of salvation that he has given us in Christ, the beginner and the finisher of our faith. And he says, run your race with perseverance, knowing that Jesus completed what is necessary for us to be brought to heaven. The second reason to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus is, he says, for the joy set before him. When Jesus ran his race, he knew that the glory that was on the other side of that suffering was going to be there. And so with perseverance and as true God, he did exactly what he needed to pay for every one of our sins. And it didn't matter how bad the opposition and the, the horrible suffering was going to be. He endured such opposition. But now God says, use that pattern of Christ. Endure and remain. Keep on that course. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And where is Jesus now? At the right hand of God. At the throne of God. Now why keep our eyes fixed on Jesus? There's a purpose to it. And the apostle tells us why. Again, I mentioned before, this is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And he says, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. <laughs> Marathons are long. They're grueling. And at times people can feel like, I can't make it. I'm not going to do this. I can't do it. And the apostle says to all of us, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and don't grow weary and don't become fatigued and don't think that uh, you're not going to make it. In fact, notice what he also reminds us. And this is law teaching. He says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your own blood. And that's a very good point. You know, sometimes when we feel like we can't go on any longer, that the battle, maybe the race has been too long or too hard, then he kind of almost puts us in our place and says, have you really shed your blood in trying to not fall into sin? I, I have to say no. Look at the Apostle Peter. What did it take for him to fall, to deny uh, on the night prior to Jesus' death? All it took was a few questions. Aren't you one of them? You were with them in the garden. And then, you know, all of a sudden the curses come down. I am not the man. I don't know the man. And the Apostle reminds us of the same thing too. That sometimes we probably give in a little too easily then, but any of us thought we would. Is it any wonder why Peter went out and wept so bitterly? Especially after the Lord had reminded him. So the same, now God reminds us, this leads us then to the next point. If we haven't resisted to that point, there are times when God is going to have to discipline us and it's going to be needed. The apostle goes on, and you have forgotten he writes in his letter. You've forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline or training, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he's he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. So, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. You know, when we are going through hard times in our lives, sometimes one of the doubts that is often uh, plaguing us or pops up in our minds is, oh, why is God uh, treating me like this? Or why is he allowing this? And notice the apostle says, remember, remember that the Lord may allow you to endure hardship. And then he says, he's treating you as sons. And he uses that word for all of us. And he uses that word for a reason. He says, we're all sons of God. We're all the same. We're all sinful. We're all brought to faith in Christ alone uh, by the Holy Spirit. We, we are all in this boat together. And we're all saved the same way. And we all receive salvation the same way. And so when we're going through hardship in our lives, God says, remember two things. First of all, he says, 
don't make light of God's discipline. In fact, the word discipline in the Greek means to train. Uh, if a toddler wants to run out into the street, you're going to say, oh, that's so cute. You got to train the toddler not to run out into the street. That is absolutely dangerous. They could hurt themselves, if not even get themselves killed. So training is absolutely necessary, and we should not make light of any training that God may deem necessary for each of us. Second thing about discipline: don't grow weary under God's discipline. The apostle says. Um, you know, that's one of the tough topics that parents always had to broach as parents, was how to discipline the kids or the grandkids. How far to take it, how, you know, when to ease up, when to keep the thumb screws on. When, and for us, notice God is treating us as sons. Compare that to the Olympics. Just finished, you know. Can you imagine somebody trying to run in the Olympics and they never train? That going to happen? They're going to be burnt toast. They, they're not even going to perform. They have to train, and training is definitely hard. So when God disciplines us, trains us, he knows exactly how much we need, how to do it, how long to keep it up, and he knows when the results that he has sought out have been completed. And he's always doing it in a loving way. We can stand up under it because the Lord disciplines those he loves. The writer to the Hebrews gives us some final encouragement about this discipline. And our race here. Because he writes, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are disciplined and everyone goes, undergoes discipline, then you're illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while, as they saw, thought best. But God disciplines us for our good. So another reason why God reminds us to endure discipline, God's training, is... Well, first of all, everybody really needs discipline. Can you imagine? What, what, what are words that we may use for kids who aren't disciplined? I mean, I've got a few words in the back of my mind that we sometimes call kids who seem to have no discipline and aren't disciplined. And God does not wish us to be like that, nor to run our Christian life and our Christian race like that. And in fact, when I grew up, uh, of course I was absolutely perfect, right? My parents just didn't know it. No, I, I was disciplined by them all the time. And yet, you know what? Sometimes I got blamed for something maybe my sisters or brothers did. And sometimes they got blamed for something I did. And then there were a lot of times where I got away with a lot of stuff. So, you know, it all evened out in the end. But I, now, years later, I respected mom and dad for what they did in trying to bring me up right. And so notice, years later, there's that respect. Now for us here, what God doesn't lie. He says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. So God is not telling us, hey, you're going to love it. I'm going to discipline you, and you're going to love it. He's not saying that. He is saying, in fact, the word in the Greek that is used for painful is the same word that is used for flogging. That whipping with the leather straps that Jesus had to undergo uh, right before his crucifixion. Painful. And so the Holy Spirit says to us, God is going to treat us as sons, and at times he will bring pain into our lives, endure hardship. This is for our good. Let's apply this in a practical way. Let's say somebody's got to have knee surgery, right? And then after the knee surgery, they don't do any of the rehab because it hurts too much, right? What's going to happen to that knee? It is going to lock up and it's going to be done. And then they're going to say, oh, we got to do it over. So in other words, it takes rehab, painful at times rehab, 
to get that muscles, sinews torn and re uh, going again uh, after surgery. And in the same way, discipline at times is going to be very painful, but notice the result. It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Think of the training that God's already done for us. And because Jesus is the beginner and finisher of our faith, let's say we, we would die tonight, or next week, or next month, or next year. What do you already have now? You already know where you're going. You already know what is being prepared for you in heaven. And it's joyful there. The joy set before us is the same joy that was set before Jesus. And you know why you're going to be there. Because Christ shed his blood for us. So, therefore, he says, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may be, not be disabled, but rather healed. In other words, he tells us all, as Christians, he says, help each other out. Help strengthen each other's uh, knees and arms and uh, things like that. Help each other rehab help each other on our race, our, each of our individual races. And we're all on the same Christian race with the same goal and the same Savior in front of us all. And the, the whole point is this, so that you and I, at the end of our race, can say and join with the Apostle Paul. Remember that famous, excellent line, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, there is now in store for me a crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearing. So God will continue to watch us complete this race that he's got all marked out for each and every one of us in our individual races, in our individual lives. And the goal is all the same. The joy that you and I will have with him and our loving Lord in heaven forever. Amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep and guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now turn to the bottom of page 6 in our worship bulletin as we join together in the two hymn verses there. Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you.